Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us with us today. Special treat, Brian Alexander, adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, Brian is an internationally known futurist, researcher, writer, speaker, consultant, and teacher working in the field of how technology transforms education. He completed his English language and literature PhD at the University of Michigan in 1997 with a dissertation on doppelgangers in romantic era fiction and poetry. Then Brian taught literature, writing, multimedia, and information technology studies at Centenary College of Louisiana. Uh, there he also pioneered multi-campus interdisciplinary classes while organizing an informational literacy initiative. Now he teaches at George, uh, Georgetown University, very prestigious school. Um, He's an adjunct professor there. But this was the article we wanted to talk to him about was the big sort, uh, fine, but not fine enough, written in 2017. Uh, professor, did I get anything wrong with your background or your introduction? Uh, no, it's uh, it's good. I would just mention that I'm a senior scholar at Georgetown and that um, my most recent book uh, is uh, about climate change and the future of higher education. It's called Universities on Fire. Um, it just came out uh, a few weeks ago, and it's visible right over my left shoulder. Okay, and I love the backdrop. I love it when people come on, and then they have just all these wall of books behind them. Uh, somebody had like a, they put themselves in the corner, so like you had the books, and they looked like they were coming at you 3D. That was pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, so we are interviewing with Brian Alexander, senior scholar, professor at Georgetown University. Uh, let's start off. Why did you write an essay about the big sort in 2017? What is the big sort? Why is it important? Why did you think it was important to write this essay six years ago? What was going on? Well, uh, what is the big sort? This is uh, Bill Bishop's book uh, where he takes a look at how he sees America sifting out into the self-reinforcing divides, more or less red versus blue in the classic uh, CNN color scheme. And I'd been hearing about this. Uh, it made a lot of attention. I'd, I'd seen references to it and I thought, okay, I should dive into it. Um, I am a futurist. My specialty is the future of higher education. That's what I research and work on. Uh, and in order to do that work, I have to have a good glimpse of the future of the entire world because higher education is so intertwined with it. And so I look at a lot of things. I mean, I look at geopolitics, I look at macroeconomics, I look at a lot of technology, uh, but sociology is very, very important. And looking at how the United States changes uh, for me is very important. I, I'm a U.S. citizen. A lot of my clients are in the U.S., but also for higher education, American higher education is, is globally very important. We're about a quarter or a fifth of the entire population of colleges and universities around the world. And we're way more influential than that. We're a major destination for study. We publish a lot of research and our pedagogy is a model for a lot of places around the world. Mm -hmm. So I thought, OK, let's let's see what's happening in the United States. Let, let's see what the big sort is about and let's see how that um, might impact higher education. Uh, so I read the book. I was very interested by it. Um, I did not really think about it much in terms of the then recent spectacular Trump election, uh, a little bit, but, but not too much. Uh, and in, par in particular, because Bishop was talking about a long running trend, something that had been going on for a generation or two. Um, and I thought overall, the idea was pretty convincing. It, it, it tied together with a few different things I'd observed. Uh, there's uh, an interesting book by Robert Putnam and a research mm. team. Bowling Alone? Um, no, no. I, I'm, that, that book actually disappointed me. No, it's called Our Kids. And uh, to give you a sense of just how history changes, he published that in 2016, and he was really hoping to get uh, a conversation going among national politicians about that. And his argument was basically that uh, America is rapidly becoming more and more economically unequal uh, and that that inequality was shaping, among other things, the experience of kids. 
and that children were growing up in increasingly different circumstances, which is a bad thing. That is, more and more kids are growing up in schools that are economically marginal, that, that marginalize kids in terms of their life choices and chances, uh, that pushes them away from higher education, while you have other schools that are just accelerating away from those, that have richer pedagogies, they have far more opportunities, and they're a great supply, you know, supply chain right into a higher education and to you know, better paying jobs. And Putman thought this was a big deal and that this was relatively recent historically. He dated back to the 1980s, if I recall. He talked longingly about his childhood in northern Ohio, where he thought in his vision, and he's a sociologist of some repute. So, I mean, he's not just making this up, right? That he right. thought that when he was growing up in the 60s and 50s, I may have the dates a little off here. It's been a while since I read it, but the populations were more integrated, that wealthy and poor people were not physically separated as they are now. And he wanted to draw attention to this. And so when the book came out, it made a lot of attention. It got uh, covered on NPR and places, but the 2016 election went in completely different directions instead, and we haven't come back to that topic. So I thought, okay, big sort sounds a lot like our kids, um, but his but Bishop's idea is a little different. Uh, he does include economic sorting, but he also thinks that we are sorting more for what he calls non-economic purposes, mm. more the culture war. Um, so if you if you're a very religious person and you think religion. Uh, matters to your conduct in life and you'd like to see more religion in the public square, then you're more likely to move to a place where other people feel the same way. And it's probably not going to be San Francisco or Austin, Texas or New York City. Um, if you if you are someone who believes that LGBTQ plus rights are very, very important, uh, maybe that describes your identity and you want to see you want to be among more people like this and you are more likely to move to a place like San Francisco or New York City. And this becomes self-reinforcing. Uh, and then this loop just, you know, everyone who lives in a place that is uh, more conservative, more red in the red-blue dynamic, you tend to want to stay there and you attract more people there. And the people who are blue in that area feel increasingly isolated and they want to move out to other places. Um, it's not a, it's also, it, that sounds kind of simple, but his vision is not, that it would be as simple as, say, what happened to the U.S. in 1860. You wouldn't have two clearly distinct countries, that there's a lot of intertwining. You know, So I, I mentioned Austin, so you think about that as a blue island in a Red Sea. Right. But, you, but you can also think about conservative swaths of New York State you know, alongside a very blue New York City. Uh, so I, I, I thought this was fascinating, um, and it had a, a lot to recommend. I had some criticisms of it, but I've, I've been talking too long, Marcus. Um, does, does this make sense, what I've said so far? It makes sense, and I just, the way I like to do it is I like to let people explain on their own before I get to the questions so that Perfect. I can develop trust and people can say, you didn't put words in my mouth, I didn't get a Good. chance to say what you put. So I always start off with, what are you saying? Why did you do this in your words? Because sometimes I pick it apart, sometimes I don't, but I want everybody to feel like, hey, I got to say my piece how I wanted it to be said, and it was received by the audience. Sure. Uh, let's, start say off, let's start off with the uh, the basics, and I have the essay here. I encourage everybody to go read it. You can check it out at his uh, uh, website, brianalexander.org, the big sort, fine, but not fine enough. This essay was written in 2017. It's six years later. So I have been doing interviews with professors, scholars, and, and writers and reporters, and we've been talking about national divorce. Obviously, you heard about Marjorie Taylor Greene on President's Say saying we need a national divorce between red and blue. We can't live together. And so I've been looking at all the polarization research and all the articles written by any academic or any newspaper or any uh, publication of repute over the last 20 years. Many of them are saying things like it's social media that mm -hmm. made us so polarized. It's gerrymandering that made us so polarized. It's extreme politicians who are making us so polarized. And what I found interesting was that all the people who are saying this are not mentioning the big sort, mm. not mentioning the book at all. They won't mention it's, it's a, social media, elite politicians, or gerrymandering, and then they will have absolutely no mention of the big sort at all, or uh, Bill Bishop, or landslide voting counties, or anything like that. Um, 
And I go, well, that's kind of interesting. You guys are saying, well, the, the, the split is here before all these reasons and yet no discovery of the big sort. And then I did some research and NPR has been consistently reporting about how this is a valid theory for the last 20 years. Mm. And mm. after the 20th professor that I talked to had absolutely no idea about the big sort or Bill <laughs> Bishop or that this had ever been going on or that this mm. is a pattern that goes back to the 1990s or that it was covered by the Wall Street Journal and Harvard and New York Times and NPR and Time Magazine. I was like, something's going on here because I'm reading all the articles. I'm looking at all the studies. It's gerrymandering, elite politicians, social media, no discussion of the big sort. When I'm talking to professors, after I got to the 15th one, who's like, what's that? And and I had a, a professor and a writer for the former Washington Post. I showed him the landslide voting counties where we used to have just a couple landslide voting counties back in the 70s, 60s, yeah. 90s. And then now it's almost all of America. Um, I'll pull wow. up the map in a second. So Wow. And he literally goes like this. I reject that map. And I'm like, you've you've never seen the map before. How can you reject it? So yeah. I'm strong. So my question to you is, is the big sort real? Does it occur? Is it a worthy theory? Do you still think six years later that it's a worthy theory? I think it is. Uh, I think it's a very worthy theory, um, but I think the problems identified with it uh, still persist. Um, I mean, I, th I think we do see more and more people trying to organize their living relationships according to ideology in, in various frames of ideology. I and mean, ideology might include attitude towards migration, religious belief, sexuality, and so on. Uh, and there's a long tradition of that in America, um, you know, especially in the you know, 19th century. A lot of people would form intentional communities uh, to try and have like minded neighbors and to live and work with them. Um, but uh, and, and I think it's pretty clear from the last couple of elections and the results um, that state and local politics are becoming very, very intense this way. So, for example, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more very Republican states pushing a whole series of interesting laws, including, you know, laws about uh, trans uh, minors, laws about books and so on. Um, and of course, ever since the repeal of Roe versus Wade, we've seen a bunch of very, uh, very red, deep red states pushing all kinds of very restrictive uh, laws, including some that are just deeply inhumane. Um, and then we see the opposite. You know, we see some deep blue states pushing some you know, very, very different directions. Uh, California is taking a lead on a lot of environmental legislation, really more than anybody else in the U.S., pushing hard on climate change, for example. Uh, so I think we'll still see this. Uh, your point about the uh, large number of, of uh, landslide counties, I think is absolutely right, because we've seen, I think really since 2000, a lot of electoral map on the national scale is more or less locked in. Uh, a few states have moved around. I mean, back in 2000, Florida was considered a purple state, Virginia considered a red state, and now those have reversed. Um, but I think in many ways, you know, no one's really contesting New York. Um, no one's really contesting Texas. Um, and so we're down to, you know, a small number of states with a large number of, of uh, flippable counties. Um, and some of those are surprising, you know, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia. Um, but I think already people are talking about 2024 in terms of what the odds are of Trump or Biden capturing those you know, relatively small numbers of states. Uh, I think this matter is, I'll get into the problems in a second. I think this matters when it comes to higher education in the sense that campuses for colleges and universities are intertwined with their local community in all kinds of ways. Um, just economically, campuses rely on the local community for all kinds of stuff, electrical power, food, transportation. And of course, the communities are often beneficially influenced by uh, a local college or university because those people buy stuff, they buy services, um, you know, they rent houses, that kind of thing. Um, and then there are also political interchanges. My favorite example was uh, in, uh, in the 1960s in the town of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, you've got a liberal arts college and you've got a military, uh, federal military academy, uh, basically a, about a mile apart from each other. So, so you yeah, know, just kind of protesting machine. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, 
I, I think there's also the fact that campuses are political creatures in other ways that uh, if if a county or a city is engaged in a political controversy, there's pressure for the university or college to take a stance. And sometimes it works the other way, that uh, the politics on campus can pressure a, a university leadership to take a public stance. And even if leadership doesn't do anything, that those activities can then become known to the public uh, and you can have an interchange that way. And technology that's developed further since uh, Big Sword came out makes that even easier and easier to happen. If, if you're teaching a class in journalism, Marcus, and I'm a student there, and I don't like your lectures, it's trivially easy for me to record you um, in different ways. Yeah, sure. Video, video photographs and get that online. Sure, uh, but if, if I may. Um, please, please. So let me just cover this map, if I may. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from the New York Times, uh, but this information, as I said, was backed up by NPR in 2022, NPR mm -hmm. in 2017, NPR in 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also been backed up by, uh, it was a couple of, uh, the daily yonder, I think was also by Bill Bishop. So anyways, this looks at landslide voting counties in the top left corner, 1992 in the bottom 2016. So if you go back to 1992, top left corner, red means don't even run there. If you're a Democrat, you have no chance. Blue means mm -hmm. don't even run there. If you're a Republican, you have no chance. Gray means competitive. Mm -hmm. We're open, you know, best ideas. Uh, based upon the situation. Maybe we vote Nixon, maybe we vote Kennedy. Hmm. And you can see how 1990, all the way down to 2016, almost all the grays wiped out. So we've lost our ability to have competitive elections. And this is a, a presidential election map by county when they're looking at landslide voting. And basically, we've lost uh, competitive election counties. There's a lot of other data. There's also data showing that uh, Americans now, I think it was in 2012, one third of them would say, I won't date somebody who doesn't share mm -hmm. politics. And now mm -hmm. it's 50%. Mm -hmm. um, you could also look at, I think, the American voter survey um, after votes. They do a survey of voters, and the number of people who would call themselves moderates has also declined by 100%. So the question I have is the big sort goes back to 1990. Gerrymandering starts around 2000. That's when it starts to become a problem with the Bush core election. I looked this up. Mm -hmm. This is what professors are saying. It starts 2000, really gets exacerbated 2010. Mm -hmm. Social media becomes the polarizing influence and starts becoming affected, uh, affecting elections around 2010, 2015. And extreme politicians that, as we know now, you know, saying all sorts of crazy stuff, really starts after Trump or towards the second um, half of Trump's presidency, 2018, 2020. Why then? We have all these authors and all these professors talking about polarization in America, and none of them can bring up the big sort. What they'll say is gerrymandering, social media, or extreme politicians. But the big sort predates all of those. The big sort predates uh -huh. gerrymandering by a decade. It predates social media by 20 years. It predates extreme politicians by 25 years. NPRs uh -huh. cover this multiple times. New York Times, Washington Post. How come basically nobody could mention this at all? And how come uh, basically nobody is clued in and there is zero discussion about how this theory predates all of these other things? And yet nobody's talking about this at all. And NPR covers it. How do we get such a total lack of awareness or recognition of this theory? And why are people in academia and the media seemingly willing to go to every other possible theory but this one, even though this has been so well documented? That's why I wanted to talk to a professor who's actually looked at this and can explain, because it's hard to talk to professionals who are even aware of this. Why are yeah. they not aware of this? It's been out there. Why are they acting like other things could be the culprit when this predates all of them? How come there's a total lack of uh, awareness or mention of this? And that's why I started off with going with asking you, professor, is this even a legitimate theory? Should Does it still hold? And you're like, yeah, it does. OK, then why is nobody else getting it? Uh, a couple of reasons, and these aren't ones I've tested out, but I'll, I'll sure. put these out here just because they, they seem plausible. Theories. Um, theories. Yeah, hypotheses. Theories. Hypotheses. I mean, hypotheses. Uh, I think one is that we are in the middle of what the British press call the tech lash, um, a, a huge backlash against Silicon Valley. And, and you can see this in, in, in all kinds of ways. You know, the rise in pop culture of tech bro billionaires as villains, that kind of thing. Um, 
And I think people really love to lard social media with all kinds of, of problems. And I could pick that apart in a lot of ways. It's, it's pretty interesting, but that's relatively recent. You know, I mean, social media, you can date it in different ways. Uh, Web 2.0 is, you know, roughly 2001, 2002. But I think they just want to see I, that's the, they want to see that as a major, major cause. Now, if you're thinking about media, you can go back to television. And think about the huge split between, say, you know, MSNBC and Fox, which goes further back. Um, but that usually gets left out. People tend not to criticize TV along those lines. So I think the technology uh, obsession uh, is a really big reason. I think a second problem uh, has to do with the big sort succeeding. Uh, people have sorted out. Uh, and increase, especially faculty and researchers. And so if someone's living in San Francisco, if someone's living in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, they're more likely to be surrounded with everybody like them. And so they're less likely to be talking about this stuff. Uh, and online, to some extent, the filter bubble theory of uh, Elia uh, Pariser is, is true. Um, you know, I tend to get certain commercials pushed my way, certain ads pushed my way. Right because of, of who I am. Uh, and it takes me in my research, I make sure to follow multiple people of multiple political backgrounds. Um, but I actually get blowback from that. I've, I've had people on Facebook, uh, you know, say, well, why do you still allow this person of this ideology to post on your wall at all? Why don't you just mm -hmm. block them? Right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think another, there's a kind of recency bias too. I think 2016 really blew up a lot of people politically. Uh, I think a lot of Democrats were deeply, deeply invested in Hillary Clinton's campaign and the spectacular disaster of that. I mean, it's really hard to overestimate just what a disaster that was. Uh, if you think about the the huge press advantage that uh, that Clinton had, her enormous war chest, you know, the lockdown on, 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 on the huge political machine she was able to yeah. mobilize uh, and then to lose everything, not just yeah. the presidency, but but Congress and so many state governments. I think for a lot of Democrats, they saw that became a traumatic incident and that became where they started thinking from. Uh, that was the kind of, uh, you know, the, the meteor, you know, from, you know, knocking out the dinosaurs. It was that kind of event. So they'll focus on that. And that's one reason why so many have been on a kind of war footing ever since. And I think Republicans, for them, this cracked open the egg of what they thought they could be. Um, and this, there's a long running, you know, kind of civil war within the Republicans in different ways, East Coast versus Middle and all kinds of things. And I think this gave permission for people like Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, to come out, you know, for the kind of cable news style, over the top Internet kind of personalities um, and that the Republicans have embraced, you know, nonstop ever since, you know, openly lying, you know, telling tall tales, um, that kind of professional wrestling stance, uh, they've really embraced that. And so I think for a lot of them, 2016, that's, that's where they start. And, and it's hard to go further back. Um, and to go back to the 1990s, well, I mean, it, for, it's, for you and I, it's disturbing to think about to what extent that's the ancient past for a lot of people. Uh, true, true. Yeah. But they have no problem bringing up gerrymandering. And saying it goes back to 2000. I mean, they're quick to grab that. I totally agree with what you're saying, by the way. There's, but, there's but, but gerrymandering, is, is, right? I mean, the thing about gerrymandering is, is first of all, this is incredibly inside baseball kind of stuff. Um, right. It's it's really technical. It, it's, right. it's hard to grasp. And gerrymandering predates the United States. I mean, it's 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 what we've always done um, <laughs> in different ways. Um, but so if you want to talk about gerrymandering now, you, you know, you really... You do have to look at, as you say, you know, 2000, 2010, these big decisions. And if you go further, I mean, even just talking about that, you've lost 90 percent of the room. Uh, you know, if you're going to go further back into the 90s and 80s, it, it's now you're you're doing pure historiography. I, yeah, I, I hear you. Um, it's just sad that we live in a time where the information arbiters, the expert or the experts, the sources the, to be trusted. Uh, in the media and in academia, um, suffer from the same biases as lay people. You know, I, I didn't like Trump either, too. I kind of got triggered, too. What good are they then? I mean, if you can't separate your bias 
And this is all I grew up hearing. Oh, I'm a news person. We're trained to separate our bias. Oh, I'm a professor. Right. I am trained by academia to separate right. my bias. Well, it turns out that, you know, Trump riled them up. That's out the window. What good are they then? Because I thought you guys were supposed to be able to clear cut, look at this, tell us the facts. I mean, professors are called professors because they're supposed to profess. The news was called the what? The fourth or fifth column mm -hmm. of democracy. These are institutions that are supposed to provide the straight and narrow um, you know, steak and potatoes as it is. And then I'm hearing from you and I've heard from many other people. Well, they're, they're humans like the rest of us and they got whipped up like the rest of us. Well, then that means we shouldn't be able to hold their word to the same level as we used to, like when Walter Cronkite was around. And then that's a, a frightening prospect. Um, and for different people, for different purposes, because if, if I mean, does that then kind of shatter the edifice of, of social knowledge in the U S does that make us even more skeptical of news media? I mean, I'm, I'm all for that, uh, personally. I mean, I, I, I believe in deep skepticism. <laughs> right. Um, but I know for quite a few people, they're worried about the, the loss of what they think of as a kind of shared truth. You mentioned Walter Cronkite, you know, thinking about that kind of centrist, you know, agreement of stuff. You know, I do a lot of work in climate change. And it's, you know, it's, it's always startling to me to see people coming up with just fantasy versions of reality around climate change yeah we just came out of the uh, out of the pandemic and w more or less um definitely a lot less of us you know we have you know 1.1 1.2 dead a million dead right but the pandemic showed just horrifying examples of people just believing nothing or making stuff up uh, my my wife was working in public health in uh, virginia county and she told me about uh, a health food restaurant whose owner and staff refused to get vaccinated because quote they were too healthy uh, and she tried explaining that's that's not how disease work. That's not how the virus works. Um, you know, I, I, I think you can see this in journalism. I mean, the, the big push towards advocacy journalism. You, know, you, you can't be neutral on a moving, you know, on a moving ship. Right. You have to. Right. You know, partake. Um, again, I, I think for so many people, they see themselves you know, in a on a war footing um, and they don't want to. They're afraid of both sides is them. Um, I saw that. I saw Lester Holt won the award for journalism, and he said uh, there can't be both sidism. Uh, being a good uh -huh. journalist means not uh -huh. looking for the other side, not even uh -huh. attempting to do that, just going, oh, this is the right side, and that's what I'm going to tell you. And he literally said that while accepting a journalism award, I think that was like two years ago. And, you know, nobody criticized him for that. And I'm like, wow, that's the total opposite of journalism from what Cronkite would have said. Yeah. Uh, and yet the man is saluted for it. And that just backs up everything you're saying. They're literally going biased news is the way to do it, folks. I mean, that's what they're, they're just straight up saying it. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes left. I want to ask you this question, though. Sure. Researchers routinely say, and I've read this many times, oh, the people are not polarized. It's it's something else. It's the elites. It's the media. It's social. This it's it's not the public. The public's not polarized. And again, they don't bring up the big sort. They don't bring up this has gone on for three decades. They don't bring up the lack of landslide counties. They don't uh, none of this. So are the people not polarized at all? We're still all in it together where it's kumbaya, no problems or are the people actually polarized and these maps showing a three decade pattern of people moving into hardcore red and hardcore left uh, communities is actually true because I'm seeing academic researchers say, no, 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 there's no polarization amongst the public. Here's something else. And yet it flies in the face of these maps. So who should I believe? Well, I think, uh, this this brings me to a couple of my criticisms of, of Bishop. Um, sure. And and one of them is that, and I don't mean this as a as a criticism of, of his work, which I think is groundbreaking, but is that it's it's too simple. Uh, red and blue is too enormously simplified uh, for describing a nation of what? What do we have? Three hundred thirty two bill uh, million people. Excuse me. Uh, with you know, and Americans are terrific at generating all kinds of ideas and positions, just about everything. I mean, if you look at red and blue, you're talking about you know these two check marks every you know every two Novembers in a row, uh, and that really does simplify things. And it, and it, it, it all kinds of things fall out of that. Uh, the real unanimity 
um, that we get in practical terms for our foreign policy just kind of disappears there. Uh, you think about the things that hit us obliquely in terms of red versus blue. Um, the cannabis legalization, for example, uh, which sometimes follows red versus blue, sometimes does not. And that's, of course, changed our society right now and still is. And we're looking for more of that to come. Uh, that doesn't quite fit in. Uh, and you don't see people, you know, the, the the divisions within red and blue. You don't see the the, uh, the libertarian versus the uh, theocrat on the on the Republican side. Uh, you, you don't see the Clintonian center neoliberal uh, part of the Democrats versus the you know uh, AOC Bernie Sanders uh, Elizabeth Warren left. Uh, and, and you don't see just the the sheer complexity of life, but also you, you don't see the fact that we tend to get along um you know our crime rate during the during the big sort plummeted uh it's gone up the past couple of years and people are still arguing about what that means but it's nowhere near where it was in the 80s and 90s uh, i mean we hyperventilate about it a lot I, I i i diss tv news all the time and this is one of the reasons is that tv news more than anywhere else just pumps up every bit of crime it can um, it bleeds, it leads. That's their motto. Right? Sure. That's, that's from local TV through big, you know, national outfits like CNN. Um, and yet our our crime rate is actually just dropped. Um, and we don't recognize that. We don't celebrate that as we should or look at the causes. How did that happen? What did we learn from this? Right. Um, so sure. uh, it's possible that we're about to engage in a low level civil war. Uh, perhaps along the line, say, of the years of silver and lead in Italy uh, in the 60s and 70s. Ah, Plato Pomo. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Do you, you know, do we see that kind of thing or something like what happened in uh, Ireland during the Troubles or Plato or Plumbo thinking about Mexico and thinking about, you know, not a civil war per se, but the uh, war on drugs, corruption, uh, uh, nightmare there. Should, may, maybe we'll head into this. We last year we saw some really interesting attacks on electrical power stations. Uh, you know, we see more and more creative uses of the internet. Perhaps we're gonna we're gonna see more shootings that start to take on a political cast right now. But um, but we might not. I mean, we do tend to you know often get along and yell at each other, um, but uh, but live together. Um, so I I mean right now those are a couple of the criticisms i would have and a couple of the limitations i would have for this theory the, the other thing to keep in mind if, if i could just one, one more point please out, please um is and maybe maybe this is one reason people don't cite bishop bishop is talking about a great division but what he's also he tends to miss or downplay is the homogeneity in american culture uh, and we've got all kinds of personalization. We have all kinds of, of minute differences, county by county, town by town, person by person. But also we have a lot of forces that are just uniform or just sift throughout the U.S. You know, you think about chain stores, for example. Uh, you sure. think about certain types of products, uh, the loathsomeness that is American cheese, for example, um, or, you know, some of the inherited beers. Um, you know, we have big avenues of homogeneity that just work through American culture. Um, sure. And I don't celebrate those very much, I don't, but I think a lot of people in practice do, you know, you go to a new town and you're lucky. Oh, there's a Quiznos or uh, you yeah. know, uh, Pep Boys. And you think, I know what that is. That's reliable. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is, um, you know, we all, everybody watches football and likes uh, right. Rose Light or Bud Light, et cetera. Like there's a national culture. Absolutely. Um, but there's also, we could say that the English speaking countries, the five that are separate countries have a common culture too. There's a love of sure. cricket and the queen, and yet they're five separate nations. Um, when I see people talk about how the public itself, and, and yes, Bill Bishop looked at, and I read some of the criticism of Bishop's work, looking at Professor Fiorina's uh, article on the big sort that wasn't, but even Fiorina admitted the sorting's happening. He just disagreed that Bill Bishop could look at just presidential elections by counties mm, mm. and say this gigantic divergence into blue and red is true based upon this only data set. And you're you're kind of hinting at the same thing, too. The, the issue that I have is that there are other data sets that buttress it. So mm. here's Wall Street yeah. Journal 2020. Um, 
You can look at this map, uh, 1974, the amount of people identified as hardcore conservative were 45%. In 2016, it was 76%. 1974, the amount of people who identified as hardcore liberal was 28%. 2016, it was 59%. If you look at this chart, it's a straight line until roughly the 90s. And then it starts expanding. This absolutely backs up Bishop's work. There's a bump in the 90s, and then it goes up, and this shows the people are sorting themselves. Um, there's also this chart uh, showing how the average Democrat and the average Republican have changed their opinion mm-hmm. from 95 to 2015. So it was, I don't know, under 25%, 95, and then it's now over uh, 40%. Uh, Democrats who view the Republican Party poorly, it was about 26, 27%, and now it's up to 30. So that's between 95 and 15. That's another data source from another sort, not Bill Bishop. Uh, there's also other people have Bloomberg, The Atlantic, 538, have all looked this up. Uh, the Cook mm-hmm. Report has backed mm-hmm. this up too. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones, and this is from uh, Time Magazine. Uh, people yeah. don't date each other. Uh, so... About a third in 2012 to more than half in 2020 um, won't date someone who's not of their political uh, beliefs. And we can also look at uh, the amount of distrust of Americans has risen. Um, Partisan divide on political issues grows even wider. Uh, This one is going back to 1994, Mm. 2017. Looks looks like a Pew research. Yeah, Pew Research, absolutely. And what they were showing is the amount of divergence on race, religion, school attendance, education, age, gender, kind of flatlined. But the difference on politics, more than double. And it's the only one, 1994 to 2017. That's not Bishop data and it backs up Bishop. So we have other data sources from Wall Street Journal, Pew, Time Magazine, Mm. looking from 1990 to 2016 that show the people themselves are being polarized. Uh, one of my other, my favorite ones, if I can find it, um, was a study. And yeah, it was taken during the um, pandemic. Hmm. Ah, but it was here. New initiative explores deep persistent divides between Biden and Trump voters. This is at the University of Virginia uh, Sabato Crystal Ball Center. Pretty good uh-huh. place. September uh-huh. 30th, 2021. Yeah, it's during COVID. I get it. But 80% of Biden voters. I'm sorry. No, this is my favorite here. Okay. 74% of Biden voters and 78% of Trump voters feel voters from the other party are a clear and present danger to the uh-huh. USA language typically reserved for an ISIL attack or a Russian nuclear strike. Uh Uh When we add this all up and you can go, oh, that's COVID. That was a bad year. People are upset. Okay. But what about the dating? What about the, um, the, the other metrics that, that kind of show people are, you know, they're getting polarized. They're sorting themselves out. Can we say that this is um, not a problem caused by the people themselves that goes back three decades? Well, now it's now it's becoming chicken and egg, right? As as it as it as it continues to cycle, um, I think the dating part, if I could, I, I think there's two factors there that are just critical, and and the data that you're looking at predates uh, the Dobbs decision mostly. Um, I think the Dobbs decision is just is just accelerating this, and uh, it's yeah. it's interesting to see how this might play out. I'm hearing a lot of reports that Trump is urging Republicans to downplay abortion and to pull back on abortion regulations because it's polling so badly. Uh, I mean, traditionally in America, you've got about one third of Americans who are pro-life, one third who are pro-choice, one third somewhere in the middle. And the extreme uh, laws that are put into place right now are basically only appealing to the one third, you know, that are uh, strongly pro-life. And they're losing the other two thirds. So it's possible we're going to see this blow up in their, in their faces. But, but when it comes to dating now, this is an immediate matter. This is a material question. You know, if you're dating somebody, what they think about abortion is now something that matters right now, tonight. Um, and uh, I mean, 
I'm seeing and hearing all kinds of stories of, you know, women squaring off dating for, you know, until Dobbs is, you know, replaced by, you know, a, say a congressional law or something. Um, but I think that's one reason for the dating. The other, and this is really interesting. This is one that's, we're just, I, I've researched for a long time and we're just starting to feel our way around, which has to do with the demographic transition uh, that, you know, you and I grew up thinking about overpopulation being the great problem. And it turns out that in the developed world and increasingly in the developing world, uh, that the opposite is where we're headed instead. Uh, if right. the US didn't have so much migration, we'd be plateaued, if not shrinking. And so thank you. As a Latino, I want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you. Latinos are. He the said biggest. it. See, I didn't. I'm not the only one saying it. He right. said it. Okay. Right. Well, you guys are also the biggest population in the U.S. after white population, and you're the biggest one that's growing, um, still. And ah, well, I don't want to get off track. I, I, and and I can say right now, um, you know, uh, ahora yo, yo estudio español. Um, you know, I'm un poco. Um, but the the. The, the, the key fact, I think, is, is that more and more people are getting more nervous about the number of children being born. And this may play out in red versus blue uh, terrain. So you may get more red people pushing for more children and blue people not wanting that, which, again, comes to dating. Right. You know, true. Are you going to use birth control? Are you going to have children? And, true. Yeah. And there there are. I'm a liberal I know a lot of conservatives. I grew up with conservatives. I still know a lot. I know a lot of liberals and conservatives doing this. There are cultural differences on almost everything. Uh, yes, there are things that people sort to, but there is kind of a set religion, guns, traditional family, et cetera, versus uh, I don't want a car. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I need mm -hmm. to get married or have a child. Uh, I'll get a loft in the city and et cetera, the kind of urban rural split. Um, you've been awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. And and again, thank you for pointing out Bill Bishop was not 100% correct. There's a lot of errors with it. What we're talking about is the general pattern he laid out, saying yeah. it goes back to 1990. Yeah. Is that true or is that not? And my, my personal feeling, and I can't prove it, is I've seen so many professors talk about hope. When I go, how do we fix this? And they go, well, I hope we can. I have a theory, can't prove it. People did not want to talk about Bill Bishop and the big sort, and they wanted to talk about gerrymandering and social media and extreme politicians because those are problems that can be easily solved. You can have laws to change the social media or right. change gerrymandering or, or remove elite politicians. You start talking about how it's the people themselves over 30 years doing it. That's not fixed by a simple legal change. That's no. hard cultural work that's going to require two to 300 million people and probably take a generation or two yeah. to fix. When you think about it like that, that's depressing. That's difficult. And it sounds like it's really difficult to fix. Can't we just pass a law to spank Facebook a little bit faster? Yeah. America back on track, Humpty Dumpty put back together again. Okay. Moving on folks. Can't prove it. No, just a sentiment I get. You don't you don't have to comment. Just something I want to put out there. Uh, My theory. Me, when, yeah, when, when, when I was a, a college student, I, to show you how old I am, I was a Soviet studies major. Hey. Uh, and and one of the one of the theories that, that we studied was that the Soviet Union was basically frozen, that there was no possibility of political change. And that what would happen, what it would take would be a demographic transition, basically a lot of people dying or retiring and new people coming up. And that's arguably what happened. Um, if I look at Generation Z, if I look at people in their teens and their 20s right now, they are radically different from their elders in ways that we haven't really seen before. Uh, you were showing uh, religion being uh, non-controversial. One of the things that's interesting is ever since 2000, people under 30 have disaffiliated from religion at levels we've never seen in American history before, um, mm -hmm. which is really amazing. I mean, this is the kind of thing people predicted in the U.S. 100 years ago, and it hasn't happened. Right. Um, so it's possible that once Generation Z ages out, into becoming into leadership positions, right? Le ages up into leadership positions, that we may see more homogeneity around this. The mm -hmm. thing that the thing that worries me, though, and this is this is the big. I I believe that climate change is the biggest challenge facing human civilization, um, and it's the deepest. It's the vastest challenge we've ever faced. 
I mean, we're, we're looking at something like World War II plus the Industrial Revolution combined, right? Mm. And in the U.S. right now, we are still bitterly divided about it in red versus blue terms. Thank so you. I really worry about our approach to this. I worry that we are way too slow in taking steps and parks were bogged down by people on the red side. Um, and this may get very ugly. Uh, we've already seen people who do basic actions like stopping at people's SUVs or something um, get threatened with you know, major jail time. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of tit for tat you know, uh, level of violence happening uh, as we edge deeper into the climate crisis. Now, I, I know a large, interesting number of Republicans are actually changing their minds on this. If you look at Republicans under 40, they tend to accept climate change is happening. Uh, I've had conversations with very conservative Republicans who think climate change is happening. Humans aren't causing it. It's just happening. So they're going to adapt. Yeah. They're, so they're ready to adapt. You know, if they're living on the sea coast, they're like, all right, this isn't a good place to live. Uh, yeah. Seen that. But, Seen in that. The, but in the meantime, at this critical stage of, of, of our decarbonization, I, I fear this is going to drag us down. Um, so that's my big fear. I appreciate that. Um, we have to go. We got another interview. Well, Would you ever be willing to come back? I'd like that very much. It's a pleasure talking with you, Marcus. Uh, you you have a great topic and a great manner. You're a really good interviewer. I'd be delighted to come back. I will email you in a few hours a copy of this video, Professor. If you can think of anybody else who might be willing to be part of an honest conversation, we'd appreciate yeah. any recommendations. And sure. we definitely want to have you back for a more well, deep dive on this. Well, I like the sound of that. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, good luck. Keep up this great project. I appreciate it. I'm going to email you soon. Please think of anybody else besides yourself who, who we may be able to reach out to. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Will do. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.